Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the message of John the Baptist, who was preaching this message in the land of Judea there during the days before and up to the time of the public ministry of Jesus Christ. This was a man who Matthew described as one who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Here was a man who was a very powerful preacher, who was willing to put his own life on the line and eventually did put his life on the line. Remember, he was killed, beheaded for the gospel message. He wasn't afraid to call the religious leaders of his days, you generation of vipers. Now think about the courage it took in his day when those people had the authority over life and death. They could take you out and stone you. There are times when it feels as though we too are preaching a message that is like a voice crying in the wilderness. As if standing out, as I did this week, out in the middle of West Texas on top of a mountain where you can see 50 miles in all directions around you, screaming at the top of our lungs, preaching the gospel message, and no one is listening. Why won't anyone listen to the message? Jesus described this phenomenon in Matthew, the 13th chapter. I've read this to you on a number of occasions. He says in Matthew, the 13th chapter, in verse 14, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, here again quoting Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear, and you shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. Why? Well, he goes on to give us the explanation in verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Notice the blame is on them. Lest, if they weren't in this condition, any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. It's a responsibility that lies on them to respond to this message, to this gospel message. But he says that he would heal them if they did turn, right? So how can God heal us or each person or each one of us? How can he heal a nation and how will he eventually heal the entirety of the world? Well, you have to begin by understanding who we are. God initiated his plan through the calling of a man called Abraham. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, I'd like to go back there and read a few of these scriptures here. And I won't. I'm just going to peruse these scriptures very quickly here. Genesis, the 12th chapter, down in verse 2, God made an incredible promise to Abraham. He called him first out of his own nation and told him to go somewhere where he didn't even know where he was going. He just packed up and said, okay, I'm going to go. And because he did that, God said, here, here in verse 1, he says, Get you out of your country and out of your kindred from your father's house into the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Notice verse 3, And I will bless them that bless you and curse them him that curses you, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. I think it's vitally important here to realize that through Abraham and his family, all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And we'll see that that is going to be a twofold promise there. And, And of course, we know the story how he was given an unimaginable trial of offering his own son, And God tested him by telling him to sacrifice his own son. And he went right up to the point where he drew the knife and and, and was actually willing to sacrifice Isaac there. And God stopped him. And let's go now to uh, chapter 22, Genesis 22. As I said, I'm going to peruse some of these scriptures here. 
to, for the lack of time to go in, instead of going into this in depth like I've done in the past, and, and many of you are very familiar with these anyway. Genesis, the 22nd chapter, down in verse 16. And of course, this is immediately following that test that Abraham was given of sacrificing or being willing to sacrifice Isaac. God says to him, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of, the, out of heaven the second time, verse 15, and said, by myself... Have I sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which are up on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And I said, it's vitally important that you understand that God... Not only did he promise Abraham, but he swore to him that he was going to bless his family and that they would become, as he describes here, as the stars of heaven. He told him on one occasion, look up and tell the stars or count the stars, so shall your seed be. Here he tells them they're going to be like the sand of the seashore and they were going to possess the gates of their enemies. So this blessing we know, if you read through that whole book of the book of Genesis was passed on to Isaac and then ultimately to Jacob, his son, his grandson, I should say. In Genesis 35, we can look at that. Genesis 35 and verse 10. Genesis 35 and verse 10. Jacob had an incredible life and he experienced quite a few things in his life that were important in the nation of Israel. Notice what it says. And God said unto him... Your name is Jacob. Of course, God had wrestled with Jacob and Jacob had overcome him and he, he actually held him and wouldn't let him go. And he had to sort of give him a, a, a chop in the leg there in the thigh to, to be able to get away. And he said, your name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel. And so Jacob's name became Israel. This was before any of the nation of Israel existed. A man named Jacob became Israel. His name became Israel. He said, you'll no book nor be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. And God had said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you, and kings shall come out of your loins. Again, as I said, the promise that was made to Abraham was passed on to Isaac and now to Jacob. We see that he was going to make not only a great nation out of him, but also a company of nations, two peoples. We've often asked the question in the past, who do you think those two nations might be in history today? Do those nations exist today? And who would they be if God swore to Abraham that there were going to be these nations that his progeny would be as the sand of the sea? Where are they today? Is it Russia and China? Is it India and Pakistan? Is it Japan and Micronesia? I mean, when you look around the world today and you look for two nations that are brother nations, that we're going to be, as we'll see here, have a common interest in their constitutions in their countries that are based on the very laws and principles found in the Word of God. Where would you look for those two nations? What two nations can you imagine would be these two nations that are ascribed here, a nation and a company of nations? And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee will I give it and thy seed after you. And down in verse 14, and God, and Jacob, I should say, set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereupon, and he poured oil thereon. So he, this pillow stone that he was laying his head on to sleep that night, he lifted it up and made it a pillar, and he anointed that pillar stone with oil. There is a stone today that once rested under the coronation chair that is called Jacob's Pillar Stone. And some have wondered whether this is the original stone 
if you look at the history of, of this stone here, how it was carried by the nation of Israel down through history from this point forward, if that in fact is the very stone that Jacob laid his head upon and then erected here and anointed with oil. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel, right there in the land of Palestine. It, and, and I said it's a very interesting fact to know that here in this age, this space age in which we live today, a, a tradition of this stone being placed underneath the coronation chair there in Great Britain still exists today. I think that is very fascinating. It says, uh, let's skip over now to Genesis, the 48th chapter. What happened to the name of Israel? And as I said, I've covered this on, on a number of occasions. I want to uh, spend a great deal of time on it. Genesis, the 48th chapter, down in verse 13. We know that Abraham, had, his son was Isaac. Isaac's name, uh, Isaac had a son named Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. We know that Jacob went on to have 12 sons. And you know the story in the book of Genesis how Joseph went down into Egypt and eventually that whole family was reunited. It was a fascinating and beautiful saga if you ever want to read it. It brings, like I said, tears to my eyes every time I read about the reuniting of those brothers uh, under Joseph's reign when he was there. And uh, this is the Jacob is about to bless his sons. And notice in verse 8, And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons whom God has given me in this place. Of course, Joseph had been in Egypt. He had married an Egyptian woman. He had two boys here. And he was about to receive a blessing from his dad, Jacob, or Israel. And notice what happens. And he brings the boys before him. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand and Israel's left, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand. And he brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head. So we know that he crossed his hands. And it says... Well, who was the younger, and he and his left hand was upon Manasseh, which was a very odd thing to do because always the firstborn received the primary blessing, but in this on this occasion he crossed his hands. It was something about those boys, something about their character, something about the way they carried themselves that, or either under the inspiration of God, he crossed his hands. And it says, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. But Manasseh didn't receive the primary blessing. It was Ephraim. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac did walk, and the God who fed me all my life long unto this day, this angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them. His name was Jacob. His name was Israel. The name of Israel then fell upon these two boys. This is one of the most critical verses in the Bible. It is one of the most important points that, are, that is so misunderstood in all of the Bible. And yet, it is one of the very keys to unlock the, prof- m- m- the vast majority of the prophecies in the Bible that have to do with the nation of Israel. Most people, when they read about the nation of Israel in these ancient prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel, they think it's happening to this little nation of Israel that's over there in the Middle East today. And yet we see that this promise that was made to Abraham and to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then was passed on to Jacob's 12 sons, a big portion, the primary portion of that blessing fell upon Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two boys. And the name Israel was carried on 
with those two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. And I said, when you, where do you look today to find two brother nations that are a company of nations and a great nation that share in their history and their belief system and, and as I said, their documents that are based on the Word of God and the, and the commandments and the statutes that God gave them originally, then you would, uh, if you looked around the world, what two nations would that be? Obviously, and if you know anything about history, you know that, that Great Britain was once the greatest empire the world has ever seen. It was a company of nations. It, sa it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. And you can go back and look at some of the history of the nation or the kingdom of, of Great Britain and know at one time that they possessed all the gates of their enemies around the world, that they had trade and powers and uh, pl capitals uh, set up all over the, no all over the world. And, of course, we believe that the United States is Manasseh, the brother nation of, of Ephraim, which was Great Britain. And as I said, you don't really have to believe that to be saved, but it is one of the principal doctrines that we preach that helps you unlock the prophecies, that some of which we're going to look at here in a moment. I want to go on here. It says, um, I want to go to Exodus, the 19th chapter. They were to become, believe it or not, a holy nation. And I'm speaking here of the nation of Israel. Notice what it says in Exodus 19th chapter, down in verse 5. It says, now this is after they came out of the land of Egypt. It says, now therefore, if you will obey my voice and indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And down in verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. They agreed to that very covenant. God said, if you will obey my voice, I'm going to cause you to ride the high places of the earth. He went on in the book of Exodus in the next chapter there. He gave them the Ten Commandments. What a wonderful set of laws. When you look around the world and you imagine a country, any country that would absolutely take those Ten Commandments and apply them as a people, can you imagine what kind of world in which we would live? Or uh, just any country at all that would take up those commandments and begin to observe them. Uh, you know, I'm fascinated at, at work and in the business relations that I have in the industry that I'm in, of how many people will lie to you? How many people use God's name in vain? How many people are willing to just shortcut and steal or use uh, maybe be a false witness against someone else? It happens all around us every day. In, in Leviticus 11th chapter, God gives us the... He gave the nation of Israel what they were to, not only how they were to conduct themselves, but what they were to eat. He gave them laws about what was clean and unclean. I had a conversation this week with a gentleman who asked me if I liked crawfish. And I said, man, I don't eat any of those bottom feeders. All of those things are down there on the bottom of the ocean in the rivers and lakes, and they're, they're vacuuming up the waste and everything of all these other fish. God gave us a list of animals that, we're, that are clean for us to eat. I said, I don't eat any hogs. Think about a hog, and even a doctor will tell you pork is terrible for you to eat because they are out there wallowing in the mire, and they're eating all the garbage and the refuse. And I said, I don't eat any possums or raccoons or squirrels or any of those things. But God, And he just looked at me, and I, it, it dumbfounds me. The looks that I get from time to time, it makes me, I mean, all they're saying is, I've never read the Bible. When they say, you don't eat shrimp? You don't eat lobsters? No, I don't. But God gave these, these uh, regulations, these restrictions on what we were eat, what is clean and what is unclean to the nation of Israel because he wanted them to be a holy nation unto him. 
In Leviticus 23, we know He gave them His holy days and the holy seasons that we're to observe. We're not to keep Christmas and Ishtar or Easter or Halloween, the worship of all of these demonic spirits and evil demons, but we're to worship the holy days that God gave us, the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, the days of Pentecost, and all of the rest of the holy days throughout the year, most people are completely oblivious to those, oh, isn't that Old Testament stuff done away? Well, no, it isn't. We'll see that in a moment too. In Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, I want to skip ahead. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 26. A warning against disobeying God's commands was given here by Moses in, through the inspiration of God. Notice down in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, down in verse six, 26, I should say. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land wherein you go over Jordan to possess. Here they are standing on the brink of the promised land. They're about to walk into the promised land under the direction of Joshua. And Moses is telling them, I'm going to kick you off of this land that you're about to possess. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, where the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and neither, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. In other words, instead of being able to worship the one true God, they're going to be carried away to a pagan country made to bow down to some ancient idol, some Buddha or some wooden statue or stone carving there instead of being able to worship the one true God. But if from thence you will seek the Lord your God, you shall, you shall find Him. And if you seek Him with all your heart, with all your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you, even in the latter days... Now, I guess that is the premise for the sermon today. Is if I could stand up and preach one last sermon for the message that we have preached for all of my life, that I've been a witness of my whole life, the message that we have preached about the identity of the nation of Israel and who we are, the United States and Britain, the Britain Commonwealth of Nations, and who they were to become, and what example they were to set, is where will they be in the latter days? What does the Bible have to say about who these people are and where they're going to be at the time of the end, the second coming of Jesus Christ in the latter days? It says, even in the latter days, if you will turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto His voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, He will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of the fathers which He swear unto you. Down in verse 33, did He ask them a question? Ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of a fire? Those people actually witnessed the very audible voice. They heard the voice on the mountain there. And as you have heard and live. Or has God essayed to go and take a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by the mighty hand, and by stretching out a stretched out arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And you know the story how he brought them out of the they were absolute slaves without any power without any military might. And God broke the very economic and military might of Egypt and brought them out. They're standing there about to walk into the promised land. And He's reminding them who they are and where they came from and how God, He says, the Lord is God, there is none else beside Him, down in verse 35. So we see the history of, of the nation of Israel. And I've gone over it so many times I could do this without even opening the pages of the Bible here about who Israel is and how they came forward in time. All 12 of those tribes entered into the promised land. They went into Palestine, under, as I said, under the leadership of Joshua. And for 570 years, they were one, they were one nation, a very primitive nation, 
indeed, with a lot of city-states, but eventually gained prominence, event, uh, you know, ultimately under the leadership of their king David, who God anointed, and, and Solomon. And they, during the reign of David and Solomon, they were absolutely at the pinnacle of their power. I'd like to go to 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. 2 Samuel, the sixth, uh, 7th chapter, I should say. 2 Samuel 7. It was during the reign of David, King David, over the nation of Israel <clears throat> that God promised that there would never fail of one of David's lineage to sit upon a throne. Let's look at that. It's called the Davidic Covenant. Second Samuel, the seventh chapter, down in verse 16, David said, I want to build you a house. Here we all are living in, in these wonderful houses, and God's ark is in a tent out here. And God says, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. He said, God is not someone that could be housed in something made by man's hands. He says, but I'm going to do this for you. Down in verse 11, And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and caused thee to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. He's talking to David. God is talking to David here. He tells him, when, you're, when you pass away and you, you become of old age and you eventually pass and your children are here, he says, my mercy shall not depart, down in verse 15, away from your lineage. He says, even though your children may be rebellious and turn their back on me, I will not drive them out of the land. I will not forget this promise that I'm making to you. Even if they're rebellious, I will chastise them, but I will not forget this promise. Verse 15, But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Again, here's another wonderful promise that God swears to David that he will uphold this heritage or this royal heritage, I should say. And uh, in Isaiah the ninth chapter, we know that speaking of Jesus Christ, it says that he, was, that he would sit upon the throne of David. And eventually, you remember the story when, when the angel appeared to Mary, she, the angel said to her, that he, would, that he would inherit, his name would be called Jesus, and that he would inherit the throne of his father, David. The question remains, did Jesus inherit that throne while he was here the first time? We'll look at that in a moment. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter is another scripture. You can write this down. I won't turn to it, but it said, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Does that throne still exist today? I believe that it does. Either that, either that throne exists today or God's word is no good. God's word, God's promise to David is no good. That throne is still on this earth today. And it's going to ultimately be inherited by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you a scripture of that in just a moment. In 2 Kings, the, uh, I should say 1 Kings, the 12th chapter. So we brought the nation of Israel up to the time of David and then Solomon. And then his grandson, David's grandson, Rehoboam, uh, the nation began to be divided. And I'd like to look at that, 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter. Well, that was the scripture I had just now. I'm, I'm sorry, it's 1 Kings, the 12th chapter. 1 Kings 12 is the next verse. 1 Kings, the 12th chapter. Down in verse 16. Now, this is after the death of Solomon. And by the way, this is around 880 B.C. The kingdom was established somewhere, I believe if, if my memory serves me right, somewhere around 1430 B.C. is when they went into the promised land. And so this is some 570 years later, around 880 B.C., that 
the nation, as we see here, is going to the, the nation of Israel, as they were called, became divided. They actually had a civil war, a revolt. Look at verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the kings hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Now, David was the king over Israel. His son Solomon had been reigning over all of Israel. His grandson Rehoboam, his, the advisors, when Rehoboam took the crown and he began to reign, his advisors told him, if you will be merciful unto these, all of these leaders, they will support you. And of course, he didn't do that. He wanted to impose upon them heavy taxation. And so the northern tribes of Israel rebelled against him. And they said, Neither we have we inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. That was the northern ten tribes rebelled against the southern tribe of Judah, as we see down in verse 20. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So we see the southern tribe, and that became known in history as the southern tribe of Judah and the northern tribes of Israel. And those two were separated. They became two separate nations. They had two dynasties of kings that ruled over each one of those nations. And you see that recorded in the, in the books of First and Second Chronicles and the books of First and Second Kings. A lot of the handbooks will give you a list of all of those kings that reign simultaneously in the southern tribe of Judah and in the northern tribe of Israel. And so that brings us forward in time um, to uh, the time when Isaiah preached. And I'd like to go out to Isaiah, the first chapter. So we have now these two separate kingdoms, these two separate dynasties here. These two separate nations, the northern tribe of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. And along comes this prophet Isaiah, who is going to give them an absolute indictment for their rebellion. And I won't read this chapter 1 of Isaiah. You can read it in your own time. But he goes through and he talks about them being an absolutely sinful nation. And he repeats what Moses said to them, that if you walk contrary to God and you disobey His commandments that he was going to drive them out. And he goes through this whole litany of their religious practices. He even calls for their repentance. Did they listen? Absolutely not. History would prove that they didn't listen. And he even told them that, you know, that they were going to suffer the vengeance of God if they didn't turn around. And that judgment would fall upon them. I'd like to go over to Isaiah the 5th chapter where he makes, uh, he gives them this parable. He says, Now will I sing unto my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof, and he planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. Fabulous thought here. I'd love to be able to do this someday, have a, have a vineyard and have a wine press and be able to make, grow my own grapes and make my own wine. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. He lets them make the choice. What do you think I ought to do with this vineyard? All the money I've spent, the labor I've done, grafting and cultivating these vines... And now I've got these old bitter wild grapes. What do you think I ought to do with it? What could have done more into my vineyard that I have done, not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked, it brought forth grapes. Uh, it, to bring forth grapes brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. And of course, he's talking here about the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. He had given them His laws, His statutes, His commandments. He had told them how to live their life, what they were to eat, how to worship Him. Over and over again, He said, If you will be faithful to Me, I will be your God and I will protect you from all of your enemies. 
He says, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do in my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So a absolute drought and all their crops would dry up. Notice what he says in verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah. His pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, for behold, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, behold, a cry. I stand here today and I think about the absolute protection that the United States has had since its inception. Our borders, the fact that we have been separated by two vast oceans and protected from foreign enemies. God promised that He would protect us. He said that we were going to be the inheritors of these fabulous blessings that He promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that we are a part of the nation of Israel and that we receive these fabulous blessings. There will be those historians today that try to rewrite history and tell you we don't deserve those blessings, those fabulous blessings that we have here in this country and those in Great Britain and all of its company of nations and countries around the world. They'll tell you that we didn't deserve those, that we got those by uh, ill means or ill-gotten gains, if you want to call them, that we went out and raped the world for the blessings that we have. I believe here the Word of God tells us that we were recipients of blessings that we didn't even deserve, but they were promises that God made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he fulfilled those fabulous promises. We could go back and look at Genesis, the 49th chapter, where I skipped over how it blesses all the 12 tribes of Israel, each one by name. But it, when it gets to, the, the, to Joseph... And it talks about him being like a vine that grows out over the wall and encompasses the whole earth and the fabulous blessings that are going to fall upon his heritage. Then you have to realize that we are recipients of both the blessings, as it says, of the, of the ground, the fruit of the ground and the fruit of the vine, the, the blessings underneath and me being in oil and gas industry. That's almost screaming off the page to me that we discovered oil and gas here in the United States. The blessings of, of medicine, the blessings of space technology and computers and science and history, all of those are absolute fabulous blessings. And I truly believe that all the world has been blessed because of the blessings God gave to this nation and the nation of Great Britain. I truly believe that. But not only was it blessings of progeny of physical seed that were going to be like the sand of the sea and material blessings, but also, he said, the scepter, remember what he said about Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And of course, it was speaking of the ultimate blessing that was going to come through Jesus Christ, through the, through the, the, one of the, his sons, Judah, that would ultimately down through the the lineage of King David, and you can read the history, or the lineage that went right on down to Jesus Christ, and that that blessing was going to be fulfilled in His coming. Uh, I want to move ahead now. I'm not going to have time to finish. The, uh, they would remain the kingdoms, uh, two separate kingdoms, until 721 B.C. The northern tribes, as we know in history, were taken away captive by the Assyrians. And they disappeared in history and became known as the lost ten tribes of the house of Israel. I don't believe they're lost. I believe you can find them today if you look. You can identify some of these nations the ten tribes that are, have a common heritage as uh, Ephraim and Manasseh that are so prevalent, I believe. The southern tribe of Judah would continue on for another 120 years and around 600 B.C. they were carried away captive by the Babylonians. And you remember the story how Daniel was there. And we'll look at a scripture here in a moment in Daniel 2. I want to go there. But you know, ultimately, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Daniel the second chapter, 
ultimately the nation of Judah returned to Palestine under Ezra and Nehemiah when they rebuilt the temple and rebuilt the wall. And that is who is there today. That's the point I wanted to make. The nation of Judah is who is there in what we call the nation of Israel today. But the nation of Israel, the name Israel, fell on Ephraim and Manasseh. And where are they today? Well, I believe that they are the United States and Britain. Britain being having received the primary blessing and Manasseh receiving the secondary blessing. But both of them became the nation of Israel or are the nation of Israel. Daniel had an incredible dream while, or I should say Nebuchadnezzar had an incredible dream while the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah, I should say, were, were in captivity in Babylon. I want to read that. He saw this great statue. It had a head of gold and breast and arms of silver and belly and thighs of brass and leg and feet of iron and the feet of iron and miry clay. And, of course, they gave, Daniel gave the interpretation. I want to skip down to that. Verse 37, it says, O king, you are a king of kings, for God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell... Now, where is that? Whatsoever, wheresoever the children of men dwell, every dwelling place that someone could live, the beast of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into your hand and made you ruler over them all. He was the king of Babylon that was the supreme power on the earth at that time. You are this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Each one of these kingdoms were going to be a world-dominating power. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all thing, things, and as iron breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. We know in history that the Babylonian Empire existed back in 600 B.C., they were subjugated by the Medo-Persian Empire. And you can even read that here in the book of Daniel when the Medo-Persians came in and while they were having a wild orgy and a party, they were overthrown by the Medo-Persian empires in 539 B.C. And some, I believe they know exactly the date that it was in October of 539 B.C. that Babylon fell. The Medo-Persian Empire would continue up until 334 when the Greco-Macedonian Empire would hold sway under Alexander. And then ultimately the final, the fourth kingdom, would be the Roman Empire in 27 BC. Let's go on to here. I just, this is a brief summation here. It's one of the longest prophecies that extends from the time of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon right down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And notice what it says about this history. It says, And whatsoever you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. These two components of this kingdom are actually going to stick somewhat together. They're going to be sticky. This clay is going to stick to this iron, but they're not going to make a very good mold. And as the toes and feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken or weak. And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one another even as iron is not mixed with the clay. This is talking about the very last resurrection of this Roman Empire. And you can read that in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, how this great beast power is going to emerge, going to arise, what we believe is in Europe, may someday be called the United States of, of Europe. A power that is going to be far greater than any nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth, more power and possess some of the greatest weapons, and they're going to be in partnership or in collusion, if you want to call that. Some sort of arrangement is going to be made between that great beast power 
and a false religious system, the second half of the, of the book of uh, Revelation, the 13th chapter, a false religious system called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth, those two are going to form some sort of a partnership here. We see that it's like iron, the strength of iron, but it has this miry mix in with it. And they too are going to rule the world as this final resurrection of this beast power as we see described here in the book of Daniel. Notice what it says. And in the days of these kings, these ten toes or these ten kings that the book of Revelation actually spells out, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So the kingdom that God is going to establish is going to completely annihilate and wipe out all of these other kingdoms. For as much as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and that break into pieces the iron and the brass, the clay and the silver and the gold, he saw this stone in his dream smack this image on its feet and the whole thing came crumbling down and it just blew away in the, in the breeze. He says, He has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the inter in interpretation thereof is sure. So here we see this prophecy, amazing prophecy by Daniel. While he's in captivity, while he's under the domination of the Babylonian Empire, looking ahead into the future through multiple uh, kingdoms that would arise. Even Daniel, at the end of Daniel, the 12th chapter, he said he didn't understand. And they said, seal this up, Daniel, till the time of the end. Because it's not going to be for many days. You're going to die and you're going to grow old and another kingdom is going to arise and then another kingdom and then another kingdom until 2,600 years are going to go by. And knowledge will be increased and people will travel to and fro. Is that today? Absolutely. Go out here in one of these major cities and stand up and look at the skies and look how many airplanes and jet aircraft are flying back and forth. And the absolute... Chaos of the cars. I drove from Decatur all the way up through McKinney the other day. That highway used to be farmland as far as you could see. Now it's automobiles as far as you can see in every direction. Red lights and headlights. Just people running everywhere. It just, the, this scripture jumps off the page at me when I think about knowledge being increased and what man has accomplished here in the 21st century. It's, it's completely amazing. Boy, I'm going to go long here. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, what was the very first thing that Jesus preached? And in his public ministry, Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Exactly the same thing that John the Baptist preached. Repent. Most people don't even know what repentance is, that it's turning around, going another direction. Repentance has to do with a change of heart, that those laws God instituted back with ancient Israel that He meant for them to carry all the way throughout their history is still in force and effect today. Jesus said, Not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all things be fulfilled. Is this as some people would like to call this, British Israelism or Armstrongism, is this something that we're preaching an elite class of people that only have this knowledge, that this nation is some sort of an elite class of people above the nations of the earth? God's Word said, if judgment begin at the house of God... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner be? With this knowledge and with these blessings came a great deal of responsibility for the people that were to carry it. And most of them have failed. Most of these nations have failed to follow God's laws and keep His commandments and His statutes and to listen to this message that seems like a voice crying in the wilderness that no one will hear. 
but it is there. It's there underneath the hum of the world's noise. It's there. It's been there all these many centuries. It's still there. It's been there for my whole life. And these scriptures here are jumping out, crying out today, saying, wake up, America. Wake up, Great Britain. Wake up, Israel. Wake up, Judah. Believe it or not, the scriptures tell us that Judah, who rejected Jesus Christ, is someday going to be joined again with Israel, and they're going to become a nation once again that is going to worship and serve Jesus Christ here on this earth. Revelation, the fifth chapter, says that we'll be kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Zechariah, the 14th chapter, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. What did they say to him at the book of Acts? You men of Judea, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus will come in like manner as you have seen him go. What did the disciples ask Jesus there? Will you at this time establish the kingdom of Israel? They thought he was going to establish it then and there. And yet the Bible tells us that it is out there in the future. Go read Matthew 24th chapter where he says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences. All of these things were going to happen. The disciples said, when will these things be? When you see all of these cataclysmic events taking place in the earth and you see a sign of... Of the, spoken of by Daniel the prophet when this great being is going to stand in the holy place saying that he is God. He says there will be a time called Jacob's trouble. There's that name again. Israel is going to be in great duress, great trouble. And then after that will be the heavenly signs. And finally the day of the Lord, he says, in that whole chapter there of, of Matthew 24. How can you read all of those scriptures and read scriptures like Isaiah the 11th chapter that says that he was going, at that time he is going to recover again a second time the nation of Israel that is in captivity that is scattered to all points of the compass. How can you understand that if you don't understand the identity of the nation of Israel, the promises that were made to Israel, and the the prophecies that are there that predict what is going to happen in the end. I'd like to close Isaiah, the second chapter. I'm going to go back to Isaiah because I want to leave on an absolutely positive note here. When Jesus Christ does come again, He is going to wreck every one of these rotten, evil kingdoms. He's going to put down all the evil, wicked rulers and dictators, and He is going to establish peace. On this earth. It tells us in Isaiah the second chapter, and many shall people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his path, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the same law that he gave the nation of Israel that includes the fourth commandment of keeping the Sabbath day, the seventh day, holy, and all of his holy days. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords and plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Russia is not going to have down the red square, there are all these tanks and armaments and put on this display. All of the nuclear weapons are going to be disassembled. All the bombers and battleships are going to be melted down into become farming implements and tractors and things that are peaceful and that cause so much stress. There is going to be the establishment of the kingdom of God here on this earth. The final word today is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't be like the people that Isaiah described, but see with your eyes and hear with your ears and understand with your heart and be converted and God will heal you and He will protect you from the days to come.